We understand how hypotension occurs intraoperatively, positive pressure ventilation, anesthesia, bleeding, vasoactive medications, and so on and so on. The thing that makes the management so difficult from the point of view of both the intravascular volume, flow, and pressure is that when we develop even the smallest amount of hypovolemia, and remember we get relative hypovolemia as soon as we put positive pressure in the chest for a period, short period of time, is it's the splanchnic organs that give up their volume to serve the central circulation. Back to the top left-hand corner here to look at this monitor. We're now actually in a, a physiology laboratory. This is a large animal experiment, a 70 kilogram animal, which is uh, uh, anesthetized, fully instrumented, so it looks just like an operating theater, and they behave exactly as humans do. Top left-hand side, heart rate is 71. MAP is 75, blood pressure is 102 over 57. We have a swan in, it's 23 over 15, with a mean PA pressure of 18. The CVP is 8, uh, the SATs are 99%, and the temperature is 35.5. So apart from the temperature, the hemodynamics are pretty much identical from the normal things we measure compared to baseline. Now this is quite an artificial scenario, but we know the animal is hypovolemic because we have 588 mils of blood that we have exsanguinated from the animal. And the compensatory mechanisms that take place up to about five, six, seven hundred mils, which is, you know, 10% uh, of, of blood volume to, 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 to 12 to 15%. There are no clues from regular hemodynamic variables. And anyone who thinks that heart rate changes, it, it does not. Heart rate changes under different circumstances, but not with pure hemorrhage. If we look on the right-hand side, we have the trends, which include MAP, stroke volume, stroke volume variation, the bottom cardiac output, et cetera, et cetera. If we had an algorithm that was just treating pressure and flow, we'd say there's no problem here. With this new variable we have, which is the hypertension prediction index, you'll notice that it has been going up since the arrow at the top, the gray downward facing arrow. From the moment that hemorrhage starts, it starts to rise. And that's the indicator of autonomic instability that is driving the reduction in splanchnic volume that's placing it into central blood volume. And just to show you that graphically, during this experiment, we put a side stream dark field imaging camera into the gut of the animal. And you'll have to take my word for it. I hope it, it projects okay. On the left-hand side, as you look at it, is perfectly healthy GI tract. We're looking at the microcirculation, the microvilli, everything's looking great. On the right-hand side is following a modest hemorrhage. And you can see the, the microvilli is starting to blanch. They're starting to become pulsatile, and that is the loss of tissue perfusion to maintain central blood volume. That is post-operative nausea and vomiting and ileus in the making. Okay, let's go on one stage further, and we've now made an intervention to fix things. So we've made the HPI go down. Uh, everything's looking pretty good to me. What do you think, Desiree, about that? Do you think our intervention's done the job? Yeah, it was perfect. Mike, do you think the interventions fixed the problem? Yeah. So. Now, what if I was to tell you that the intervention was the resident, it's always the residents, isn't it? <laughs> that the, um, the resident had started a phenylephrine infusion. What would you think then? Yeah, well, that's um, fine. That's OK, is okay. it? OK. Yeah. OK, well, they've started the phenylephrine infusion against the background of being relatively hypovolemic. So what you see here on the left-hand side is a healthy-looking gut microvillus. On the right-hand side, you now have no blood flow in the GI tract. This GI tract is now suffering badly. So that is the thing that we worry about, is if we take a simple pressure-only approach, as opposed to our obsession with hemodynamic monitoring that addresses fill, flow, and pressure, that only then can you try and guarantee end-organ perfusion. So Mike, talk us through this. Yeah. So. I think if you back up to a high le level, really, uh, what you're showing is that it's easy to detect when someone's lost a lot of blood. And we know that four or 500 mils, people tolerate very well. It's why when you go to the blood donation, you, you give a unit of blood, you have a cup of tea, and you go back to work. So we know that's OK. So all our monitors work, don't they, during urevolemia, so and everything's normal. Um, and it's often easy clinically to detect when you, you know, uh, 
hypovolemia when you've lost more than that 500 mils or more, so 15 to 40 percent. And you can use all the other uh, stroke volume trends, stroke volume variability, they're all very sensitive. The, the big problem is, as you've shown there, is that you're getting effect in the, in the gray zone where you're losing that intermediate volume uh, up to 500 mils, which might not be a catastrophe, but it does tend to have a downstream effect, whether it's PONV, uh, whether it's splanchnic blood supply. Because if you think if we're doing a colorectal surgery operation and they're doing an anastomosis, anastomosis where do we want the blood flow during and, and at the end of surgery? It's to the gut and the anastomosis. Um, and so we can't really identify very well uh, it, when we lose that splanchnic blood flow, but HPI seems to be a real opportunity, I think, to detect this, this hemodynamic instability and when you're getting uh, the splanchnic circulation which is starting to suffer. So, so I know from everything you've written, I've heard you lecture over the decades, Mike, is that, um, and I think we practice the same way, is you, you've got to start by baselining intravascular volume. You can't, you're, if, if, you're, if you're at sea, you can't know where you are until you get a fix on the polar stars. I know we've got different equipment now. And for intravascular volume, there is no way of knowing that the tank is full except for challenging to make sure it is full. There's no, you can't, you get an ultrasound out, you can do whatever you want. You can't know where you are until you baseline. Is that, is that what you do, Mike, and yeah, how do you do it? I, I think the key thing is to try and optimize your stroke volume. You, you, and by optimizing stroke volume, you actually also optimize contractility. So you, you really want to maximize efficiency of your heart before you start surgery. And that's why we did the two-point optimization, because you've got the physiology at the start of uh, anesthesia. So you, your patient comes in, you then anesthetize them, you've got all these things happening, drugs, positive pressure, vas uh, ventilation. Um, so we actually stabilize the patient uh, and look for fluid responsiveness after that and before the start of surgery. So that was our first point of optimization. So drapes on, you've got your monitoring all connected up. You, I think you do table tilts and we fluid challenges. We do table challenge. tilts, yeah, okay, you can do table tilts, passive leg raise, but yeah, yeah, table tilts in the OR. So you just use that time to say, I'm going to give fluid boluses if they, you get a table tilt positive. And then you stop, you say, I know my volume status now, I've, I've found my polar star, if you see what I mean, I know what depth I'm at. You know, yeah, and that is the patient's optimal stroke volume. But if you don't baseline, you don't know where you are. No, and, th and that's the big problem because everyone's different and even people who have consistently had oral carbohydrate drinking, we mapped this in the UK, we found different people need different volumes once they uh, undergo the effects, physiological effects of positive pressure ventilation. Desiree, is that the way you do it? Yeah, it, and in the enhanced recovery protocols that I've developed with our team uh, in Louisville several, several years ago, um, that was exactly how we did it. We didn't do the table tilt. We would, um, use uh, some of the advanced hemodynamic parameters, but that's exactly was to create our baseline. And we had a really evolved enhanced recovery program that we did hydrate everyone before and we still, still did this. And it's interesting, we look at, I mean, there's over 100 goal-directed therapy trials reported now. If you, if you meta-analyze the volume of fluid, it's a 600 mil difference, which is remarkable that it's mm -hmm. about 10% of blood volume for the trials that are positive at a baseline. It's more complicated than that, but that, that's the baseline. Well, and I think so the other thing is the Fedora study showed actually very minimal change in volume yeah, given totally. it was yeah. the timing of the fluid, and there's much more fluid up front, yeah. which is what we found as well. So tell us about this, Mike, this concept of balancing the circulation. Well, th this again, taken to high level, the, the two things that are truly evidence-based to affect outcome after surgery are oxygen delivery and mean arterial pressure. So uh, following this algorithm means that you fix, the, fix both of those things without causing harm. Because by doing fill and flow first, you're fixing your cardiac index. And normally, if someone's got normal oxygen saturation or hemoglobin above eight, you, you will have your, uh, an optimal oxygen delivery. So uh, tell and us then you okay. just titrate your vasopressor after that. Because we know that if you titrate vasopressors when you've got a full circulation, you don't cause harm. So tell us how you use the Edwards technology to achieve that goal, Mike. Yeah, so this is the secondary screen showing the HPI, which is the hypotension index. It's interesting that I, I don't really use the HPI to wait for it to alarm anymore. I find that a number over 50 is like a, a number saying this patient is becoming unstable. 
So you step in early? Step in early and I give small fluid boluses, 150 mils, normally with a 20 mil syringe in line, um, and see if that brings the HPI down. Uh, but you can go into the secondary screen um, and it, it gives you your preload pr parameters. So you, you've got, you can uh, track stroke volume, you can look at stroke volume variation, which I think is very well evidence-based as long as you're using eight mils per kilo tidal ventilation. You can also track contractility, but to be honest, most patients don't vary that much unless you've got some real physiological load on them like a pneumoperitoneum. So, so what you're really doing is optimizing the, the filling of the heart and the contractility and the revs of the engine and getting maximal efficiency off your, uh, off your engine. And after that, you're just titrating your afterload. So then you're in a position where you just balance preload and afterload for the whole, the whole of the surgery. And, and that basic physiology is unchanged for decades, possibly hundreds of years. It's just we've got better things to help us to, 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 to deliver it. Desiree, yeah. is that familiar? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, um, I think part of it is, is now having these different parameters and, and really learning how, in, in your experience, Mike, how to actually use them in practice. I think that was, you know, a large hurdle. But once you kind of get set, so I'm just going to note in passing that since the introduction of HPI, the, the one thing that we've seen clearly to date is that it can reduce intraoperative hypotension. And the studies that were done to introduce HPI that resulted in the centers that used it, those centers within, the, within MPOG, and there is a, some abstract presentations at this meeting to reiterate this message, is the labeling from the FDA change to say the HPI guided hemodynamic management results in a significant reduction, 57% in IOH. All but one site saw the difference that it's safe and it's effective. At this meeting, you'll see a subsequent follow-up propensity match study from MBOG in, in abstract form that will be presented. It's been chosen for one of the special presentations that will reinforce that message. So please do go and have a look at that more closely if you remain skeptical. Mike, uh, final, uh, uh, Close coming in here. This is how you set up the screen at your new yeah. center in the USA at uh, UPenn. Yeah, I think one of the hardest things in introducing any technology with lots of numbers and variables when you're teaching residents or the nurses on the ICUs is how do you get predictable interaction with the monitor so they understand what's happening. And the field flow pressure really helps them uh, know that they've got to optimize the stroke volume first and then look at contractility in the index. And so we've set the monitor up like this. So at the top, you've got the arterial waveform so that you know you've got real information because the one thing worse than no information is wrong information. So, so you know that's the source of truth. We then trend the stroke volume and then you've got other indicators like SVV and PPV to help you uh, optimize preload. And there's also another button you can do, which is a, a, basically a, a fluid challenge or a passive leg raise uh, and look at the response to that. And then you know if the cardiac index, we use 2.2 or above as, as, the, as the hard deck. And then after that, you're really just titrating your, your vasopressor to your map of 65 or more. So it's really simple. Fix the fluid. If your contractility is low, and you know that if there's ASA 3 or 4, we might go in with a very low dose epinephrine and see what that does to improve the cardiac index to get above 2.2. And after that, it's either phenylephrine or norepinephrine if it's an ASA 3 or 4 patient. Summary of the key points, hypotension and hypoperfusion are common, harmful, and can be reduced. Continuous pressure and flow monitoring important to balance the circulation. Utilizing a common framework such as fill flow pressure strategy can aid in identifying and treating the underlying mechanism that may contribute to hemodynamic instability. And the Acumen HPI software can help you prevent or treat hypotension. Is HPI is an indicator of hemodynamic instability it's an indicator, possibly, of tissue hypoperfusion. I think we've demonstrated that in the animal model. And it's an indicator of volume status, which is yet to be proved out.